Act One of Candida. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Chenevere. Candida by George Bernard Shaw. Act One. A fine October morning in the northeast suburbs of London, a vast district, many miles away from the London of Mayfair and St. James, much less known there than the Paris of the Rue de Rivoli and the Champs-Élysées, and much less narrow, squalid, fetid, and airless in its slums. Strong and comfortable, prosperous, middle-class life, wide-streeted, myriad-populated, well served with ugly iron urinals radical clubs tram lines and a perpetual stream of yellow cars enjoying in its main thoroughfares the luxury of grass-grown front gardens untrodden by the foot of man save as to the path from the gate to the hall door but blighted by an intolerable monotony of miles and miles of graceless characterless brick houses black iron railings stony pavements slaty roofs and respectably ill-dressed or disreputably poorly dressed people quite accustomed to the place and mostly plodding about somebody else's work which they would not do if they themselves could help it the little energy and eagerness that crop up show themselves in cockney cupidity and business push even the policemen and the chapels are not infrequent enough to break the monotony the sun is shining cheerfully and though the smoke effectually prevents anything whether faces or hands or bricks or mortar from looking fresh and clean it is not hanging heavily enough to trouble a londoner this desert of unattractiveness has its oasis near the outer end of the hackney road is a park of two hundred seventeen acres fenced in not by railings but by a wooden paling and containing plenty of greensward trees a lake for bathers flower beds with the flowers arranged carefully in patterns by the admired cockney art of carpet gardening and a sand pit imported from the seaside for the delight of the children but speedily deserted on its becoming a natural vermin preserve for all the petty fauna of kingsland hackney and hoxton a bandstand an unfinished forum for religious anti-religious and political orators cricket pitches a gymnasium and an old-fashioned stone kiosk are among its attractions wherever the prospect is bounded by trees or rising green grounds it is a pleasant place where the ground stretches far to the grey palings with bricks and mortars sky signs crowded chimneys and smoke beyond the prospect makes it desolate and sordid the best view of victoria park is from the front window of st dominic's parsonage from which not a single chimney is visible the parsonage is a semi-detached villa with a front garden and a porch visitors go up the flight of steps to the porch tradespeople and members of the family go down by a door under the steps to the basement with a breakfast room used for all meals in front and the kitchen at the back upstairs on the level of the hall door is the drawing room with its large plate glass window looking on the park in this room the only sitting room that can be spared from the children and the family meals the parson the reverend james maver morell does his work he is sitting in a strong round-backed revolving chair at the right hand end of a long table which stands across the window so that he can cheer himself with the view of the park at his elbow at the opposite end of the table adjoining it is a little table only half the width of the other with a typewriter on it his typist is sitting at this machine with her back to the window the large table is littered with pamphlets journals letters nests of drawers an office diary postage scales and the like a spare chair for visitors having business with the parson is in the middle turned to his end 
Within reach of his hand is a stationary case and a cabinet photograph and a frame. Behind him, the right-hand wall, recessed above the fireplace, is fitted with bookshelves, on which an adept eye can measure the parson's divinity and casuistry by a complete set of Browning's poems and Maurice's theological essays, and guess at his politics from a yellow-backed Progress and Poverty, Fabian Essays, A Dream of John Ball, Marx's Capital, and half a dozen other literary landmarks in socialism. Opposite him on the left, near the typewriter, is the door. Further down the room, opposite the fireplace, a bookcase stands on a cellaret with a sofa near it. There is a generous fire burning, and the hearth, with a comfortable armchair and a chapanned flower-painted coal shuttle at one side, a miniature chair for a boy or girl on the other, a nicely varnished wooden mantelpiece with neatly molded shelves, tiny bits of mirror let into the panels, and a travelling clock in a leather case, the inevitable wedding present, and on the wall above a large autotype of the chief figure in Titan's Virgin of the Assumption is very inviting. Altogether, the room is the room of a good housekeeper vanquished as far as the table is concerned by an untidy man, but elsewhere mistress of the situation. The furniture, in its ornamental aspect, betrays the style of the advertised drawing-room suite of the pushing suburban furniture dealer but there is nothing useless or pretentious in the room the paper and panelling are dark throwing the big cheery window in the park outside into strong relief the reverend james maver morell is a christian socialist clergyman of the church of england and an active member of the guild of st matthew and the christian social union a vigorous genial popular man of forty robust and good-looking full of energy with pleasant hearty considerate manners and a sound unaffected voice which he uses with the clean athletic articulation of a practised orator and with a wide range and perfect command of expression he is a first-rate clergyman able to say what he likes to whom he likes to lecture people without setting himself up against them to impose his authority on them without humiliating them and to interfere in their business without impertinence his wellspring of spiritual enthusiasm and sympathetic emotion has never run dry for a moment he still eats and sleeps heartily enough to win the daily battle between exhaustion and recuperation triumphantly with all a great baby pardonably vain of his powers and unconsciously pleased with himself he has a healthy complexion a good forehead with the brows somewhat blunt and the eyes bright and eager a mouth resolute but not particularly well cut and a substantial nose with the mobile spreading nostrils of the dramatic orator but like all his features void of subtlety the typist Miss Prosperine Garnet is a brisk little woman of about thirty, of the lower middle class, neatly but cheaply dressed in a black merino skirt and a blouse, rather pert and quick of speech, and not very civil in her manner, but sensitive and affectionate. She is clattering away busily at her machine, whilst Morel opens the last of his morning's letters. He realizes its contents with a comic groan of despair prospering another lecture morell yes the hoxton freedom group wants me to address them on sunday morning great emphasis on sunday this being the unreasonable part of the business what are they prospering communist anarchists i think morell just like anarchists not to know that they can't have a parson on sunday Tell them to come to church if they want to hear me. It will do them good. Say I can only come on Mondays and Thursdays. Have you the diary there? Prosperine, taking up the diary. Yes. Morel. Have I any lecture on for next Monday? Prosperine, referring to the diary. Tower Hamlet's Radical Club. Morel. Well, Thursday then? Prosperine. English Land Restoration League. 
Morel. What next? Prosperine. Guild of St. Matthew on Monday, Independent Labor Party, Greenwich Branch on Thursday, Monday, Social Democratic Federation, Mild Inn Branch, Thursday, First Communion Class. Impatiently. Oh, I'd better tell them you can't come. There are only half a dozen ignorant and conceited coastmongers without five shillings between them. Morel, amused. Ha <laughs> ha, but you see they're near relatives of mine, Miss Garnet. Prosperine, staring at him. Relatives of yours? Morel. Yes, we have the same father in heaven. Prosperine, relieved. Oh, is that all? Morel, with a sadness which is a luxury to a man whose voice expresses it so finely. Ah, you don't believe it. Everybody says it. Nobody believes it. Nobody. Briskly getting back to business. Well, well, come, Miss Prosperine, can't you find a date for the co coasters? What about the 25th? That was vacant the day before yesterday. Prosperine, referring to diary. Engaged. The Fabian Society. Morel. Bother the Fabian Society. Is the 28th gone, too? Prosperine. City dinner. You're invited to dine with the Founders Company. Morel. That'll do. I'll go to the Hoxton Group of Freedom instead. She enters the engagement in silence with implacable disparagement of the Hoxton anarchists and every line of her face. Morel bursts open the cover of a copy of The Church Reformer, which has come by post, and glances through Mr. Stuart Henlam's leader and the Guild of St. Matthew News. These proceedings are presently enlivened by the appearance of Morel's curate, the Reverend Alexander Mill, a young gentleman gathered by Morel from the nearest university settlement, whither he had come from Oxford to give the East End of London the benefit of his university training. He is a conceitedly well-intentioned, enthusiastic, immature person with nothing positively unbearable about him except a habit of speaking with his lips carefully closed for half an inch from each corner, a finicking earthulation, and a set of horribly corrupt vowels, notably all for o, all for o, this being his chief means of bringing Oxford refinement to bear on hackney vulgarity. Morel, whom he has won over by a dog-like devotion, looks up indulgently from the church reformer as he enters and remarks, Well, Lexy, late again as usual. Lexy, I'm afraid so. I wish I could get up in the morning. Morel, exulting in his own energy, Ha, ha, whimsically, watch and pray, Lexy, watch and pray. Lexy, I know rising wittily to the occasion but how can i watch and pray when i am asleep isn't that so miss prossy prospering sharply miss garnet if you please lexy i beg your pardon miss garnet prospering you've got to do all the work today lexy why prospering never mind why it will do you good to earn your supper before you eat it for once in a way as i do come don't dawdle you should have been off on your rounds half an hour ago lexy perplexed is she in earnest morel morel in the highest spirits his eyes dancing yes i am going to dawdle today lexy you you don't know how Morel, heartily, ha, ha, don't die. I'm going to have this day all to myself, or at least the forenoon. My wife's coming back. She's due here at 11.45. Lexi, surprised. Coming back already? With the children? I thought they were to stay to the end of the month. Morel, so they are. She's only coming up for two days to get some flannel things for Jimmy and to see how we're getting on without her. Lexy anxiously. But, my dear Morel, if what Jimmy and Fluffy had was Scarlatina, do you think it wise? Morel. Scarlatina? Rubbish! German measles! 
I brought it into the house myself from the Pycroft Street School. A parson is like a doctor, my boy. He must face infection as a soldier must face bullets. He rises and claps Lexy on the shoulder. Catch the measles if you can, Lexy. She'll nurse you, and what a piece of luck that will be for you, eh? Lexy, smiling uneasily, it's so hard to understand you about Mrs. Morell. Morell, tenderly, ah, my boy, get married, get married to a good woman, and then you'll understand. That's a foretaste of what will be best in the kingdom of heaven we are trying to establish on earth. That will cure you of dawdling. An honest man feels that he must pay heaven for every hour of happiness with a good spell of hard, unselfish work to make others happy. We have no more right to consume happiness without producing it than to consume wealth without producing it. Get a wife like my Candida, and you will always be in arrears with your repayment. He pats Lexy affectionately on the back, and is leaving the room when Lexy calls to him. Lexy, oh, wait a bit, I forgot. Morel halts and turns with the doorknob in his hand. Your father-in-law is coming round to see you. Morel shuts the door again with a complete change of manner. Morel, surprised and not pleased. Mr. Burgess? Lexy, yes, I passed him in the park, arguing with somebody. He gave me a good day and asked me to let you know that he was coming. Morel, half incredulous. But he hasn't called here for, uh, I may almost say, for years. Are you sure, Lexy? You're not joking, are you? Lexy, earnestly. No, sir, really. Morel, thoughtfully. Hmm. Time for him to take another look at Candida before she grows out of his knowledge. He resigns himself to the inevitable and goes out. Lexy looks after him with beaming, foolish worship. Lexy, what a good man! What a thorough, loving soul he is! He takes Morel's place at the table, making himself very comfortable as he takes out a cigarette. Prosperine, impatiently pulling the letter she had been working at off the typewriter and folding it. Oh, a man ought to be able to be fond of his wife without making a fool of himself about her. Lexy, shocked. Oh, Miss Prossy! Prosperine, rising busily and coming to the stationary case to get an envelope in which she encloses the letter as she speaks. Candida here and Candida there and Candida everywhere. She licks the envelope. It's enough to drive anyone out of their senses. Thumping the envelope to make it stick, to hear a perfectly commonplace woman raved about in that absurd manner merely because she's got good hair and a tolerable figure. Lexy, with reproachful gravity. I think her extremely beautiful, Miss Garnet. He takes the photograph up, looks at it, and adds with even greater impressiveness, extremely beautiful how fine her eyes are prosperine her eyes are not a bit better than mine now he puts down the photograph and stares astutely at her and you know very well that you think me dowdy and second-rate enough lexy rising majestically heaven forbid that i should think of any of god's creatures in such a way he moves stiffly away from her across the room to the neighborhood of the bookcase. Prosperine, thank you. That's very nice and comforting. Lexy, saddened by her depravity, I had no idea you had any feelings against Mrs. Morell. Prosperine, indignantly, I have no feelings against her. She's very nice, very good-hearted. I'm very fond of her and can appreciate her real qualities far better than any man can. He shakes his head sadly and turns to the bookcase, looking along the shelves for a volume. She follows him with intense pepperiness. You don't believe me? He turns and faces her. She pounces at him with spitfire energy. You think I'm jealous. 
oh what a profound knowledge of the human heart you have mr lexy mill how well you know the weaknesses of woman don't you it would be so nice to be a man and have a fine penetrating intellect instead of mere emotions like us and to know that the reason we don't share your amorous delusions is that we're all jealous of one another she abandons him with a toss of her shoulders and crosses to the fire to warm her hands lexy ah if you women only had the same clue to man's strength that you have to his weakness miss prosby there would be no woman question prosperine over her shoulder as she stoops holding her hands to the blaze where did you hear morel say that you didn't invent it yourself you're not clever enough lexy that's quite true i am not ashamed of owning him that as i owe him so many other spiritual truths he said it at the annual conference of the women's liberal federation allow me to add that though they didn't appreciate it i a mere man did he turns to the bookcase again hoping that this may leave her crushed prosperine putting her hair straight at the little panel of mirror in the mantelpiece well when you talk to me give me your own ideas such as they are and not his you never cut a poorer figure than when you are trying to imitate him lexy stung i try to follow his example not to imitate him prosperine coming at him again on her way back to her work yes you do you imitate him why do you tuck your umbrella under your left arm instead of carrying it in your hand like anyone else why do you walk with your chin stuck out before you hurrying along with that eager look in your eyes you who never get up before half past nine in the morning why do you say knowledge in church though you always say knowledge in private conversation bah do you think i don't know she goes back to the typewriter here come and set about your work we've wasted enough time for one morning here's a copy of the diary for today she hands him a memorandum lexy deeply offended thank you he takes it and stands at the table with his back to her reading it she begins to transcribe her shorthand notes on the typewriter without troubling herself about his feelings mr burgess enters unannounced he is a man of sixty made coarse and sordid by the compulsory selfishness of petty commerce and later on softened into sluggish bumptuousness by overfeeding and commercial success a vulgar ignorant guzzling man offensive and contemptuous to people whose labor is cheap respectful to wealth and rank and quite sincere and without rancor or envy in both attitudes finding him without talent the world has offered him no decently paid work except ignoble work and he has become in consequence somewhat hoggish but he has no suspicion of this himself and honestly regards his commercial prosperity as the inevitable and socially wholesome triumph of the ability industry shrewdness and experience in business of a man who in private is easy-going affectionate and humorously convivial to a fault corporally he is a podgy man with a square clean-shaven face and a square beard under his chin dust-colored with a patch of gray in the center and small watery blue eyes with a plaintively sentimental expression which he transfers easily to his voice by his habit of pompously intoning his sentences burgess stopping on the threshold and looking round they told me mr morell was here prosperine rising he's upstairs i'll fetch him for you burgess staring boorishly at her you're not the same young lady as used to typewrite for him prosperine no burgess assenting no uh, she was younger miss garnet stolidly stares at him then goes out with great dignity 
he receives this quite obtusely and crosses to the hearth rug where he turns and spreads himself with his back to the fire starting on your rounds mr mill lexy folding his paper and pocketing it yes i must be off presently burgess momentously don't let me detain you mr mill what i come about is private between me and mr morell lexy huffily i have no intention of intruding i am sure mr burgess good morning burgess patronizingly oh good morning to you morell returns as lexy is making for the door morell to lexy off to work lexy yes sir morell patting him affectionately on the shoulder take my silk handkerchief and wrap your throat up there's a cold wind away with you lexy brightens up and goes out burgess spoiling your curates as usual james good morning when i pay a man and his living depends on me i keep him in his place morell rather shortly i always keep my curates in their places as my helpers and comrades if you get as much work out of your clerks and warehousemen as i do out of my curates you must be getting rich pretty fast will you take your old chair he points with curt authority to the armchair beside the fireplace then takes the spare chair from the table and sits down in front of burgess burgess without moving just the same as heva james morell when you last called it was about three years ago i think you said the same thing a little more frankly your exact words then were just as big a fool as ever james burgess soothingly well perhaps i did but with conciliatory cheerfulness i mean no offence by it a clergyman is privileged to be a bit of a fool you know it's only because in his profession that he should anyhow i come here not to rake up old differences but to let bygones be bygones suddenly becoming very solemn and approaching morell james three years ago you done me a hill turn you done me out of a contract and when i give you harsh words in my natural disappointment you turn my daughter again me well i've come to act the part of a cheerishin offering his hand i forgive you james morell standing up confound your impudence burgess retreating with almost lachrymose depreciation of this treatment is that becoming language for a clergyman james and you so particular too morell hotly no sir it is not becoming language for a clergyman i used the wrong word i should have said damn your impudence that's what saint paul or any honest priest would have said to you do you think i have forgotten that tender of yours for the contract to supply clothing to the workhouse burgess in a paroxysm of public spirit i acted in the interest of the ratepayers james it was the lowest tender you can't deny that morell yes the lowest because you paid worse wages than any other employer starvation wages ay worse than starvation wages to the women who made the clothing your wages would have driven them to the streets to keep body and soul together getting angrier and angrier those women were my parishioners i shamed the guardians out of accepting your tender i shamed the ratepayers out of letting them do it i shamed everybody but you boiling over how dare you sir come here and offer to forgive me and talk about your daughter and burgess easy james easy easy don't get into a fluster about nothing i knowed i was wrong morell fuming about have you i didn't hear you burgess of course i did i own it now come i ask your pardon for the letter i wrote you is that enough morell snapping his fingers that's nothing have you raised the wages burgess triumphantly yes morell stopping dead 
What? Burgess, unctuously, I've turned a model employer. I don't employ no women now. They're all sacked, and the work is done by machinery. Not a man has less than six pence an hour, and the skilled hands get the trade union rate. Proudly, what have you to say to me now? Morel, overwhelmed. Is it possible? Well, there's more joy in heaven over one sinner that repenteth. Going to Burgess with an explosion of apologetic cordiality. My dear Burgess, I most heartily beg your pardon for my hard thoughts of you. Grasps his hand. And now, don't you feel better for the change? Come, confess, you're happier. You look happier. Burgess, ruefully. Well, perhaps I do. I suppose I must, since you notice it. At all events, I get my contracts accepted by the county council. Savagely. They doesn't have nothing to do with me unless I paid fair wages. Hurse em for a parcel of meddling fools. Morel, dropping his hand, utterly discouraged. So that was why you raised the wages. He sits down moodily. Burgess, severely in spreading mounting tones, why else should I do it? What does it lead to but drink and unhappiness in working men? He sets himself magisterially in the easy chair. It's all very well for you, James. It gets you into the papers and makes a great man of you. But you ever think of the arm you do, putting money into the pockets of working men that don't know how to spend it, and taking it from people that might be making a good use on it? Morel, with a heavy sigh, speaking with cold politeness. Ah, what is your business with me this morning? I shall not pretend to believe that you are here merely out of family sentiment. Burgess, obstinately. Yes, I am. Just family sentiment and nothing else. Morel, with weary calm. I don't believe you. Burgess, rising threateningly. Don't say that to me again, James Maver Morel. Morel, unmoved. I'll say it just as often as may be necessary to convince you that it's true. I don't believe you. Burgess, collapsing into an abyss of wounded feeling. Oh, well, if you're determined to be unfriendly, I suppose I'd better go. He moves reluctantly towards the door. Morel makes no sign. He lingers. I didn't expect to find an unforgiving spirit in you, James. Morel is still not responding. He takes a few more reluctant steps doorwards. Then he comes back, whining. We used to get on well enough, spite of our different opinions. Why are you so changed to me? I give you my word I come here in pure friendliness, not wishing to be on bad terms with my own daughter's husband. Come, James. Be it cherish it and shake hands. He puts his hand sentimentally on Morel's shoulder. Morel, looking up at him thoughtfully. Look here, Burgess. Do you want to be as welcome here as you were before you lost that contract? Burgess. I do, James. I do. Honest. Morel. Then why don't you behave as you did then? Burgess. Cautiously removing his hand. Uh, how do you mean? Morel. I'll tell you. You thought me a young fool, then. Burgess, coaxingly. No, I didn't, James. I— Morel, cutting him short. Yes, you did. And I thought you an old scoundrel. Burgess, most vehemently depreciating this gross self-accusation on Morel's part. No, you didn't, James. Now you do yourself a injustice. Morel. Yes, I did. Well, that did not prevent our getting on very well together. God made you what I call a scoundrel, and he made me what you call a fool. The effect of this observation on Burgess is to remove the keystone of his moral arch. He becomes bodily weak, and with his eyes fixed on Morel in a helpless stare, puts out his hand apprehensively to balance himself, as if the floor had suddenly sloped under him. Morel proceeds in the same tone of quiet conviction. 
it was not for me to quarrel with his handiwork in the one case more than in the other so long as you came here honestly as a self-respecting thorough convinced scoundrel justifying your scoundrelism and proud of it you are welcome but and now morell's tone becomes formidable and he rises and strikes the back of his chair for greater emphasis i won't have you sniveling about being a model employer and a converted man when you're only an apostate with your coat turned for the sake of a county council contract he nods at him to enforce the point then goes to the hearthrug where he takes up a comfortably commanding position with his back to the fire and continues no i like a man to be true to himself even in wickedness now come either take your hat and go or else sit down and give me a good scoundrelly reason for wanting to be friends with me burgess whose emotions have subsided sufficiently to be expressed by a dazed grin is relieved by this concrete proposition he ponders it for a moment and then slowly and very modestly sits down in the chair morell has just left that's right now out with it burgess chuckling in spite of himself <laughs> well you are a queer bird james and no mistake but almost enthusiastically one can't help liking you besides as i said afore of course one don't take all a clergyman says seriously or the world couldn't go on could it now he composes himself for graver discourse and turning his eyes on morell proceeds with dull seriousness well i don't mind telling you since it's your wish we should be free with one another that i did think you a bit of a fool once and i'm beginning to think that perhaps i was behind the times a bit morell delighted aha you're finding that out at last are you burgess portentously yes times a changing more'n i could have believed five year ago no sensible man would have thought of taking up with your ideas i used to wonder you was let preach at all why i know a clergyman that's been kept out of his job for years by the bishop of london although the poor feller's not a bit more religious than you are but today if any one were to offer to bet me a thousand pound that you'll end up by being a bishop yourself i shouldn't venture to take the bet you and your crew are getting influential i can see that they'll have to give you something some day if it's only to stop your mouth you had the right instinct after all james the line you took is the paying line in the long run for a man of your sort morell decisively offering his hands shake hands burgess now you're talking honestly i don't think they'll make me a bishop but if they do i'll introduce you to the biggest jobbers i can get to come to my dinner parties burgess who has risen with a sheepish grin and accepted the hand of friendship you will have your joke james our quarrel's made up now isn't it a woman's voice say yes james startled they turn quickly and find that candida has just come in and is looking at them with an amused maternal indulgence which is her characteristic expression she is a woman of thirty-three well built well nourished likely one guesses to become matronly later on but now quite at her best with a double charm of youth and motherhood her ways are those of a woman who has found that she can always manage people by engaging their affection and who does so frankly and instinctively without the smallest scruple so far she is like any other pretty woman who is just clever enough to make the most of her sexual attractions for trivially selfish ends but candida's serene brow courageous eyes and well-set mouth and chin signify largeness of mind and dignity of character to ennoble her cunning in the affections a wise-hearted observer looking at her would at once guess that whoever had placed the virgin of the assumption over her hearth did so because he fancied some spiritual resemblance between them and yet would not suspect either her husband or herself of any such idea or indeed of any concern with the art of titian just now she is in bonnet and mantle 
laden with a strapped rug with her umbrella stuck through it, a handbag, and a supply of illustrated papers. Morel, shocked at his remissness, Candida, why, looks at his watch and is horrified to find it so late, my darling, hurrying to her and seizing the rug strap, pouring forth his remorseful regrets all the time. I intended to meet you at the train. I let the time slip, flinging the rug on the sofa. I was so engrossed by returning to her. I forgot. Oh, he embraces her with penitent emotion. Burgess, a little shamefaced and doubtful of his reception, how are you, Candy? She, still in Morel's arms, offers him her cheek, which he kisses. James and me has come to an understanding, a honorable understanding, ain't we, James? Morel, impetuously, oh, bother your understanding. You've kept me late for Candida, with compassionate fervor. My poor love, how did you manage about the luggage? How— Candida, stopping him and disengaging herself— there 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 i wasn't alone eugene came down yesterday and we traveled up together morel pleased eugene candida yes he's struggling with my luggage poor boy go out dear at once or he will pay for the cab and i don't want that morel hurries out candida puts down her handbag then takes off her mantle and bonnet and puts them on the sofa with the rug chatting meanwhile well papa how are you getting on at home burgess the ouse ain't worth livin in since you left it candy i wish you'd come round and give the girl a talkin to who's this eugene that's come with you candida oh eugene's one of james's discoveries he found him sleeping on the embankment last june haven't you noticed our new picture pointing to the virgin he gave us that burgess incredulously gorn do you mean to tell me your own father that cab touts and such like off the embankment buys pictures like that severely don't deceive me candy it's i church picture and james chose it himself candida guess again eugene isn't a cab tout burgess then what is he sarcastically a nobleman i suppose Candida, delighted, nodding. Yes, his uncle's a peer, a real live earl. Burgess, not daring to believe such good news. No. Candida, yes. He had a seven-day bill for fifty-five pounds in his pocket when James found him on the embankment. He thought he couldn't get any money for it until the seven days were up and he was too shy to ask for credit oh he's a dear boy we are very fond of him burgess pretending to belittle the aristocracy but with his eyes gleaming huh, i thought you wouldn't get a peers never visiting in victoria park unless he were a bit of a flat looking again at the picture of course i don't old with that picture candy but still it's eye class first-rate work of art i can see that be sure you introduce him to me candy he looks at his watch anxiously i can only stay about two minutes morel comes back with eugene whom burgess contemplates moist-eyed with enthusiasm he is a strange shy youth of eighteen slight effeminate with a delicate childish voice and a hunted tormented expression and shrinking manner that show the painful sensitiveness that very swift and acute apprehensiveness produces in youth before the character has grown to its full strength yet everything that his timidity and frailty suggest is contradicted by his face he is miserably irresolute does not know where to stand or what to do with his hands and feet is afraid of burgess and would run away into solitude if he dared but the very intensity with which he feels a perfectly commonplace position shows great nervous force and his nostrils and mouth show a fiercely petulant willfulness as to the quality of which his great imaginative eyes and fine brow are reassuring he is so entirely uncommon 
as to be almost unearthly and to prosaic people there is something noxious in his unearthiness just as to poetic people there is something angelic in it his dress is anarchic he wears an old blue serge jacket unbuttoned over a woolen lawn tennis shirt with a silk handkerchief for a cravat trousers matching the jacket and brown canvas shoes in these garments he has apparently laid in the heather and waded through the waters but there is no evidence of his having ever brushed them as he catches sight of a stranger on entering he stops and edges along the wall on the opposite side of the room morel as he enters come along you can spare us quarter of an hour at all events this is my father-in-law mr burgess mr marchbanks marchbanks nervously backing against the bookcase glad to meet you sir burgess crossing to him with great heartiness whilst morell joins candida at the fire glad to meet you i'm sure mr marchbanks forcing him to shake hands how do you find yourself this weather hope you ain't letting james put no foolish ideas into your head marchbanks foolish ideas oh you mean socialism no burgess that's right again looking at his watch well i must go now there's no help for it you're not coming my way are you mr marchbanks marchbanks which way is that burgess victoria park station there's a city train at twelve twenty five morell nonsense eugene will stay to lunch with us i expect marchbanks anxiously excusing himself no i i burgess well well i shan't press you i bet you'd rather lunch with candy some night i hope you'll come and dine with me at my club the free man founders in norton fulget come say you will marchbanks thank you mr burgess where is norton fulgate down in surrey isn't it burgess inexpressibly tickled begins to sputter with laughter candida coming to the rescue you'll lose your train papa if you don't go at once come back in the afternoon and tell mr marchbanks where to find the club burgess roaring with glee <laughs> down in surrey <laughs> that's not a bad one <laughs> well i never met a man as didn't know north and fulgate before abashed at his own noisiness uh, good-bye mr marchbanks i know you're too high-bred to take my pleasantry in bad part he again offers his hand marchbanks taking it with a nervous jerk not at all burgess bye-bye candy i'll look in again later on so long james morell must you go burgess don't stir he goes out with unabated heartiness morell oh i'll see you out he follows him out eugene stares after them apprehensively holding his breath until burgess disappears candida laughing <laughs> well eugene he turns with a start and comes eagerly toward her but stops irresolutely as he meets her amused look what do you think of my father marchbanks i i hardly know him yet he seems to be a very nice old gentleman candida with gentle irony and you'll go to the freeman founders to dine with him won't you marchbanks miserably taking it quite seriously yes if it will please you candida touched do you know you are a very nice boy eugene with all your queerness if you had laughed at my father i shouldn't have minded but i like you ever so much better for being nice to him marchbanks ought i to have laughed i, I noticed that he said something funny but i am so ill at ease with strangers and i never can see a joke i'm very sorry he sits down on the sofa his elbows on his knees and his temples between his fists with an expression of hopeless suffering candida bustling him good-naturedly oh come you great baby you you are worse than usual this morning why were you so melancholy as we came along in the cab 
Marchbanks. Oh, that was nothing. I was wondering how much I ought to give the cabman. I know it's utterly silly, but you don't know how dreadful such things are to me. How I shrink from having to deal with strange people. Quickly and reassuringly. But it's all right. He beamed all over and touched his hat when Morel gave him two shillings. I was on the point of offering him ten. Candida laughs heartily. Morel comes back with a few letters and newspapers which have come by the midday post. Candida. Oh, James, dear, he was going to give the cabman ten shillings. Ten shillings for a three minutes drive. Oh, dear. Morel, at the table, glancing through the letters. Never mind her, Marchbanks. The overpaying instinct is a generous one, better than the underpaying instinct, and not so common. Marchbanks, relapsing into dejection. No, cowardice, incompetence. Mrs. Morell's quite right. Candida. Of course she is. She takes up her handbag. And now I must leave you to James for the present. I suppose you are too much of a poet to know the state a woman finds her house in when she's been away for three weeks. Give me my rug. Eugene takes the strapped rug from the couch and gives it to her. She takes it in her left hand, having the bag in her right. Now hang my cloak across my arm. He obeys. Now my hat. He puts it into the hand which has the bag. Now open the door for me. He hurries up before her and opens the door. Thanks. She goes out, and Marchbanks shuts the door. Morell, still busy at the table. You'll stay to lunch, Marchbanks, of course. Marchbanks, scared. I mustn't. He glances quickly at Morell, but at once avoids his frank look, and adds, with obvious disingenuousness, I can't. Morell, over his shoulder. You mean you won't? Marchbanks, earnestly, no, I should like to indeed, thank you very much, but... Morel, breezily, finishing with the letters and coming close to him, but, 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 bosh, if you like to stay, stay. You don't mean to persuade me you have anything else to do. If you're shy, go and take a turn in the park and write poetry until half-past one, then come in and have a good feed. Marchbanks, thank you. I should like that very much, but I really mustn't. The truth is, Mrs. Morell told me not to. Uh, she said she didn't think you'd ask me to stay to lunch, but that I was to remember if you did that you didn't really want me to. Plaintively, she said I'd understand, but I don't. Please don't tell her I told you. Morell, drolly, oh, is that all? Won't my suggestion that you should take a turn in the park meet the difficulty? Marchbanks. How? Morell, exploding good-naturedly. <laughs> Why, you duffer! But this boisterousness jars himself as well as Eugene. He checks himself and resumes with affectionate seriousness. No, I won't put it that way. My dear lad... In a happy marriage like ours, there is something very sacred in the return of the wife to her home. Marchbanks looks quickly at him, half anticipating his meaning. An old friend or a truly noble and sympathetic soul is not in the way on such occasions, but a chance visitor is. The hunted, horror-stricken expression comes out with sudden vividness in Eugene's face as he understands. Morel, occupied with his own thoughts, goes on without noticing it. Candida thought I would rather not have you here, but she was wrong. I am very fond of you, my boy, and I should like you to see for yourself what a happy thing it is to be married as I am. Marchbanks. Happy? Your marriage? You think that? You believe that? Morel, buoyantly. I know it, my lad. La Rochouchade said that there are convenient marriages, but no delightful ones. You don't know the comfort of seeing through and through a thundering liar and rotten cynic like that fellow. 
Ha <laughs> ha! Now off with you to the park and write your poem. Half past one, sharp. Mind, we never wait for anybody. Marchbanks wildly. No, stop! You shan't. I I'll force it into the light. Morel puzzled. Eh? Force what? Marchbanks, I must speak to you. There is something that must be settled between us. Morel with a whimsical glance at the clock. Now? Marchbanks passionately. Now, before you leave this room. He retreats a few steps and stands as if to bar Morel's way to the door. Morel, without moving and gravely, perceiving now that there is something serious the matter. I'm not going to leave it, my dear boy. I thought you were. <clears throat> Eugene, baffled by his firm tone, turns his back on him, writhing with anger. Morel goes to him and puts his hand on his shoulder, strongly and kindly, disregarding his attempt to shake it off. Come, sit down quietly and tell me what it is. And remember, we are friends, and need not fear that either of us will be anything but patient and kind to the other, whatever we may have to say. Marchbanks, twisting himself round on him. Oh, I am not forgetting myself. I am only, covering his face desperately with his hands, full of horror. Then dropping his hands and thrusting his face forward fiercely at Morel, he goes on threateningly. You shall see whether this is a time for patience and kindness. Morel, firm as a rock, looks indulgently at him. Don't look at me in that self-complacent way. You think yourself stronger than I am, but I shall stagger you if you have a heart in your breast. Morel, powerfully confident. Stagger me, my boy. Out with it. Marchbanks. First. Morel. First, Marchbanks, I love your wife. Morel recoils, and after staring at him for a moment in utter amazement, bursts into uncontrollable laughter. Eugene is taken aback, but not disconcerted, and he soon becomes indignant and contemptuous. Morel, sitting down to have his laugh out, Oh, why, my dear child, of course you do. Everybody loves her. They can't help it. I like it. But, looking up whimsically at him, I say, Eugene, do you think yours is a case to be talked about? You're under twenty. She's over thirty. Doesn't it look rather too like a case of calf love? Marchbanks, vehemently, you dare say that of her? You think that way of the love she inspires? It is an insult to her. Morel, rising, quickly in an altered tone. To her? Eugene, take care. I have been patient. I hope to remain patient. But there are some things I won't allow. Don't force me to show you the indulgence I would show to a child. Be a man. Marchbanks, with a gesture as if sweeping something behind him. Oh, let us put aside all that cant. It horrifies me when I think of the doses of it she has had to endure in all the weary years during which you have selfishly and blindly sacrificed her to minister to your self-sufficiency. You, turning on him, who have not one thought, one sense in common with her. Morel, philosophically, she seems to bear it pretty well looking him straight in the face. Eugene, my boy, you are making a fool of yourself, a very great fool of yourself. There's a piece of wholesome plain speaking for you. Marchbanks. Oh, do you think I don't know all that? Do you think that the things people make fools of themselves about are any less real and true than the things that they behave sensibly about? Morel's gaze wavers for the first time. He instinctively averts his face and stands listening, startled and thoughtful. They are more true. They are the only things that are true. You are very calm and sensible and moderate with me because you can see that I am a fool about your wife. 
just as no doubt that old man who was here just now is very wise over your socialism because he sees that you are a fool about it morel's perplexity deepens markedly eugene follows up his advantage plying him fiercely with questions does that prove you wrong does your complacent superiority to me prove that i am wrong morel turning on eugene who stands his ground marchbanks some devil is putting these words into your mouth it is easy terribly easy to shake a man's faith in himself to take advantage of that to break a man's spirit is devil's work take care of what you are doing take care marchbanks ruthlessly i know i'm doing it on purpose i told you i should stagger you they confront one another threateningly for a moment then morel recovers his dignity morel with noble tenderness eugene listen to me some day i hope and trust you will be a happy man like me eugene chafes intolerantly repudiating the worth of his happiness morel deeply insulted controls himself with fine forbearance and continues steadily with great artistic beauty of delivery you will be married and you will be working with all your might and valor to make every spot on earth as happy as your own home you will be one of the makers of the kingdom of heaven on earth and who knows you may be a pioneer and master builder for i am only a humble journeyman for don't think my boy that i cannot see in you young as you are promise of higher powers than i can ever pretend to i well know that it is in the poet that the holy spirit of man the god within him is most godlike it should make you tremble to think of that to think that the heavy burden and great gift of a poet may be laid upon you marchbanks unimpressed and remorseless his boyish crudity of assertion telling sharply against morel's oratory it does not make me tremble it is the want of it in others that makes me tremble morel redoubling his force of style under the stimulus of his genuine feelings and eugene's obduracy then help to kindle it in them in me not to extinguish it in the future when you are as happy as i am i will be your true brother in the faith i will help you to believe that god has given us a world that nothing but our own folly keeps from being a paradise i will help you to believe that every stroke of your work is sowing happiness for the great harvest that all even the humblest shall one day reap and last but trust me not least i will help you to believe that your wife loves you and is happy in her home we need such help marchbanks we need it greatly and always there are so many things to make us doubt if once we let our understanding be troubled even at home we sit as if in camp encompassed by a hostile army of doubts will you play the traitor and let them in on me marchbanks looking round him is it like this for her here always a woman with a great soul craving for reality truth freedom and being fed on metaphors sermons stale perorations mere rhetoric do you think a woman's soul can live on your talent for preaching morel stung marchbanks you make it hard for me to control myself my talent is like yours in so far as it has any real worth in it it is the gift of finding words for divine truth marchbanks impetuously it's the gift of gab nothing more and nothing less what has your knack of fine talking to do with the truth any more than playing the organ has i've never been in your church but i've been to your political meetings and i've seen you do what's called rousing the meeting to enthusiasm that is you excited them until they behaved exactly as if they were drunk and their wives looked on and saw clearly enough what fools they were 
Oh, it's an old story. You'll find it in the Bible. I imagine King David, in his fits of enthusiasm, was very like you, stabbing him with the words. But his wife despised him in her heart. Morel, wrathfully, leave my house, do you hear? He advances on him threateningly. Marchbanks, shrinking back against the couch, let me alone, don't touch me. Morel grasps him powerfully by the lapel of his coat. He cowers down on the sofa and screams passionately. Stop, Morel! If you strike me, I'll kill myself. I won't bear it. Almost in hysterics. Let me go. Take your hand away. Morel, with slow, empathic scorn. You little sniveling, cowardly whelp. Releasing him. Go, before you frighten yourself into a fit. Marchbanks, on the sofa, gasping but relieved by the withdrawal of Morel's hand. I'm not afraid of you. It's you who are afraid of me. Morel, quietly as he stands over him. It looks like it, doesn't it? Marchbanks, with petulant vehemence. Yes, it does. Morel turns away contemptuously. Eugene scrambles to his feet and follows him. You think because I shrink from being brutally handled, because, with tears in his voice, I can do nothing but cry with rage when I am met with violence, because I can't lift a heavy trunk down from the top of a cab like you, because I can't fight you for your wife as a navy would, all that makes you think I'm afraid of you? But you are wrong. If I haven't got what you call British pluck, I haven't got British cowardice either. I'm not afraid of a clergyman's ideas. I'll fight your ideas. I'll rescue her from her slavery to them. I'll pit my own ideas against them. You are driving me out of the house because you daren't let her choose between your ideas and mine. You are afraid to let me see her again. Morel, angered, turns suddenly on him. He flies to the door in involuntary dread. Let me alone, I say. I'm going. Morel, with cold scorn. Wait a moment. I am not going to touch you. Don't be afraid. When my wife comes back, she will want to know why you have gone. And when she finds that you are never going to cross our threshold again, she will want to have that explained, too. Now I don't wish to distress her by telling her that you have behaved like a blackguard. Marchbanks, coming back with renewed vehemence. You shall. You must. If you give any explanation but the true one, you are a liar and a coward. Tell her what I said, and how you were strong and manly, and shook me as a terrier shakes a rat and how I shrank and was terrified, and how you called me a sniveling little whelp and put me out of the house. If you don't tell her, I will. I'll write to her. Morel, taken aback. Why do you want her to know this? Marchbanks, with lyric rapture. Because she will understand me and know that I understand her. If you keep back one word of it from her, if you are not ready to lay the truth at her feet as I am, then you will know to the end of your days that she really belongs to me and not to you. Goodbye. Going. Morel, terribly disquietened. Stop. I will not tell her. Marchbanks, turning near the door. Either the truth or a lie, you must tell her if I go. Morel, temporizing. Marchbanks, it is sometimes justifiable. Marchbanks, cutting him short. I know, to lie. It will be useless. Goodbye, Mr. Clergyman. As he turns, finally, to the door, it opens, and Candida enters in housekeeping attire. Candida, are you going, Eugene? Looking more observantly at him. Well, dear me, just look at you, going out into the street in that state. You are a poet, certainly. Look at him, James. She takes him by the coat and brings him forward to show him to Morel. 
look at his collar look at his tie look at his hair one would think that somebody had been throttling him the two men guard themselves against betraying their consciousness here stand still she buttons his collar ties his handkerchief in a bow and arranges his hair there now you look so nice that i think you'd better stay to lunch after all though i told you you mustn't it will be ready in half an hour she puts a final touch to the bow he kisses her hand don't be silly marchbanks i want to stay of course unless the reverend gentleman your husband has anything to advance to the contrary candida shall he stay james if he promises to be a good boy and to help me to lay the table marchbanks turns his head and looks steadfastly at morell over his shoulder challenging his answer morell shortly oh yes certainly he had better he goes to the table and pretends to busy himself with his papers there marchbanks offering his arm to candida come and lay the table she takes it and they go to the door together as they go out he adds i am the happiest of men morell so was i an hour ago end of act one